sitting in a very rickety chair, so I'm very sorry about any uh, background noise it makes. Can't tell if I'm in focus or not. Clearly, I don't know how to use my own camera. Okay, let's get started. I promised myself I'd make this video, so even though I feel like no one really wants it, I don't care. It's my channel. I can do what I want. It's not really something I advertise a lot or something I really talk about often, but I'm a big fan of chart watching the Billboard Hot 100. I just, you know, love looking at what songs are the most popular and which ones aren't. And especially because I don't listen to a lot of pop music, or at least recently I haven't been listening to a lot of pop music, it's interesting to find out like what music trends are happening even though I'm not like actively aware of them, if that makes sense. So every year when the Billboard Hot 100 year-end list comes out, I listen to all 100 songs and I make my top 10 best and worst hit songs of each year. And I've been doing this for a very long time now and for a little bit less of that time, but still for a long time, I've been wanting to make a video where I talk about it. They're some of my favorite videos to watch on the internet around the holiday season and I figured I'm gonna make my own. So um, even though I mainly talk about like TV shows and movies on this channel, uh, I'm gonna talk about music because I want to. So yeah, I wasn't planning on making this be like the next video on the channel. The next video is supposed to be the Radio Rebel video, which was gonna be a nice transition into me talking about music. But as always, I have a lot more to say and it's taking a longer time to make. So this one should be a little bit faster. Um, so yeah. Originally, I wasn't going to talk about the worst hits of the year just because, I don't know, sometimes I feel bad saying mean things, especially to people who like aren't bad. But like a lot of the music that I thought was bad this year was mostly like <laughs> offensive on a personal level. So I guess at that point it's like, well, I don't like this artist in general, so I don't feel bad talking shit about them, I guess. Uh, but we're going to go through it very quickly because a lot of these songs make me uncomfortable. So, yeah, we're going to start with the worst. We're going to do from 10 to 1 my worst, maybe mention some honorable mentions, and then 10 to 1 best, and maybe some honorable mentions. Okay. First honorable mention, or I guess I should say dishonorable mention, for the worst list is Die For You by The Weeknd, specifically the version featuring Ariana Grande. Uh, Ariana Grande doesn't sound good on this song. So there we go. Is it funny that Positions by Ariana Grande ended up on my Spotify rap this year? I don't know, after all of the controversies coming out, listening back to that song was like... <laughs> wild. Everyone should listen to Positions again, because it like, it like, kills in modern day context. Anyways, no offense to Ariana, it's not her fault. Um, but why was this The Weeknd song popular this year? I feel like I don't even remember, like the reason as to why. I mean, it's a decent 2016 cut. I actually quite like the song. It works well on the album Starboy. I love this album. I don't have it with me. I'm back at my, my dad's house, so I don't have my a lot of my CDs with me, sorry. But like, I like this song in the context of the album, but it just feels unnecessary as a hit. Like, it's not good enough to be number one, in my opinion, you know what I mean? So even though I like the song, I feel the need to mention it here because like, what, what are we doing? Guys, <laughs> what are we doing? Uh, I don't like The Weeknd that much to pull up random deep cuts and make them hits. Also, can I just say that The Weeknd has had a very bad 2023 along with Ariana Grande. Their entire careers have just been PR nightmares this past year with The Idol and with Ariana Grande recording that movie. I guess just in general, they're not good for film considering they just are absolutely imploding. <laughs> So that's also kind of a reason why. I didn't want to include like, you know, their real life drama, but I mean, it's hard to avoid. Star Wars is probably my favorite The Weeknd album though. So like, there you go, I guess. I don't really have many other dishonorable mentions, so we'll just get into the top 10. Number 10 is I Like You, A Happier Song by Post Malone featuring Doja Cat. Now, <laughs> Post Malone is going to end up on both lists, which is a very, very interesting thing. Now, I haven't listened to 12 Carat Toothache, uh, but I didn't hear good things about it, so I'm not, I'm not really interested, sorry. And this song isn't even that bad. Like, I'm not offended by it. I'm just confused, and I don't really... 
like that it exists. Like, I'm sorry. I mean, Post Miller and Doja Cat working together is perfectly fine. I don't think it's weird at all. Um, I just wish the song wasn't shit. <laughs> the Bad Post Malone album I'm pretty sure came out in 2022. And Austin came out in 2023. This is one of those situations where I Like You is more of a 2022 hit, but since I didn't make a list for 2022, it's not on a worst list for that year. So that's why I'm talking about it now. Maybe if I ever like retrospectively do like every year from tw the 2020s, um, this will be awkward and I'll have to like change it up a bit, but whatever. That's the case for a few songs on this list, so let's just move on. Doja Cat had a really weird year, in my opinion. Like, I just became extremely bored of her <laughs> very, very quickly. Like, I was shocked at how non-enthused I was by all of the new music that was coming out from her. And maybe this song has something to do with it. I'm, I almost, I'm almost sure that's the case. So I was actually a fan before she, you know, really hit it big in pop music. So it's not that I don't like her in general, I do. It's just, man, man, I don't give a fuck about her. I'm sorry. Like, when the music hits, I enjoy. But when she's not making good music, I don't find myself interested. And also, she's just too much of an embarrassing mess on the internet for me to emotionally care about her... <laughs> and her artist persona, if that makes sense. I think Attention has like one of the best verses, but the chorus is just weak as all hell, man. It is extremely bad. I hope people don't get mad at me for this. This is why I don't talk about bad stuff. But like her verse on this song is uh, shit. It's bad, like wow. If this song comes on the radio, uh, I want to change it, but like if I can't, I won't say out loud like, ugh, this song is bad, I'll just like deal with it. But like, I don't want to listen to it ever. So there's number 10. Number nine is Made You Look by Ma Megan Trainor. Okay, this was a 2022 hit. I fully realized that. Like the only reason why it's on this, this year end list is from like 2022 residuals. And it was popular around the Christmas season of last year, which is why like it got sprinkled into this year. It's a big problem that Billboard has, especially this year. It was <laughs> fucking bullshit. That's another reason why I didn't want to talk about it is because the Billboard Hot 100 year has been so weird for 2023 that like, it kind of feels like too much for me to just like jump in right away and do, but like I've already committed. So for those who don't know, Billboard actually cut this year's tracking period by like three weeks. Normally, you know, you do 52 weeks because that's what a full year is. But they've been doing, I think, 50 weeks or maybe 51 weeks for a while now. And this year specifically, they cut it to 49. So, like, <laughs> they were done tracking music in fucking October, which is wild. I think the conspiracy theory or, like, the prevailing reason as to why this was is because of their stupid award show that no one watches. They probably didn't want to make Taylor Swift Artist of the Year and they wanted Morgan Wallen because, you know, he'd actually fucking show up to the award show. So they were like, okay, we're cutting it off before 1989 Taylor's version comes out so we, like, you know, can not give the award to her. Now, I don't know if that's, like, tinfoil hat bullshit or not, but what I do know is that uh, Billboard fucked over their charts for the year-end list. So that's why I'm talking about Made You Look by Megan Trainer. Again, maybe if I ever do make a worst and best hit songs of 2022, uh, it might also be on that. I don't care. It's my list. I can do whatever I want. I've never really been a fan of Megan Trainor, if I'm being honest. It baffles me that Gen Z as a whole did a full 180 on the Megan Trainor experiment for literally no reason. <laughs> Like, I remember when Made You Look was being hinted at and when it originally dropped, everyone was like, oh no, Megan Chandler's back, retailer workers, run for your lives. But then all of a sudden, like, she hired a really good social media manager and, you know, got on TikTok.com, <laughs> the TikTok app. And before you know it, she's like the queen of TikTok now and all the Gen Z kids are like, oh my gosh, she's so cool and quirky. Like, no. <laughs> I bet she's a perfectly fine person. I'm not here to say that like you shouldn't like Megan Trainer, do whatever you want, but I just, I can't stand any of the songs I've heard from her. And I feel bad about that because she's probably a great person, but God, I can't, it's bad. They're all bad, I'm sorry. I hope Megan Trainer and Mr. Spy Kid 
are living a wonderful, happy life together, but made you look sounds bad. And it makes me very upset that the people of my generation thought that this cringy millennial garbage was okay to have as a hit in 2022, which is why I'm talking about it now. Let's move on. Next is Under the Influence by Chris Brown. Now, Chris Brown is trying to fucking kill me by that jump scare. Jesus Christ. I don't like Chris Brown. And I think in a blessed year where he doesn't drop an album, we shouldn't give him another hit. But he literally did release an album this year. Why is no one talking about it? This happened like a month ago. What's going on? I mean, I don't want to hear about a new Chris Brown album, but still. I thought I'd at least hear some people being like, Oh no, new Chris Brown music, everyone cover your ears. But no. Nothing. Radio silence. We just want random bullshit from 2019, apparently. This is another situation where, like, an old song got, like, trending, and then people actually started listening to it, and then because he's an established artist, the radio picked it up, and it's like, why are we doing this? Why? Chris Brown can't sing. He's a dancer who can't even use auto-tune properly. Like, why, why did we ever keep him around for as long as we've been keeping him around? Like, he doesn't provide anything good or happy to the music scene or society as a whole. I would say no offense to Chris Brown fans out there, but like, unless you're under the age of five, you know what he's done. You know who he is as a person. More power to you, I guess. Either way, boo Chris Brown. Please get off my airwaves. Uh, speaking of someone I don't want to get off my airwaves, uh, we have Drake with Search and Rescue. Do I need to say anything about this? It's Search and Rescue by Drake. Like, <laughs> I think it speaks for itself at how bad it is. Do you ever, like, wish that an artist doesn't know you exist? But not because you'd be embarrassed, but because you'd be embarrassed for them? Like, imagine how embarrassing it would be for Drake if he knew I existed. Like, you know, don't you have better things you could be doing in your life? Like, I don't know, being a father to your child? I'm not even going to talk about sonically what doesn't work about it because make this album very sonically cohesive i mean drake just sounds bored with life at this point he doesn't even sound like he wants to be here so like how am i supposed to feel enthused about the music you know what i mean these are just tax write-offs to him at this point so next song next song is i'm good blue by david guetta and bb rexa now this is more of a 2022 hit as well but what is David Guetta doing in 2023? What is he doing in the 2020s at all? What is he doing past 2016 on the charts? I'm just like, I've never been interested in David Guetta. I've never been interested in like, what he does as a musician and as like an EDM producer. Like, because I don't think he's interested in being a musician. I think he's interested in making money. Although I don't know him well. Maybe maybe he has more artistic integrity than that. But like, it doesn't come across in the music, that's for sure. And as for Bibi Rexa, she's never made a, a good song. She has yet to make a good song, as far as I'm aware. And like, that makes me feel bad for her. Because like, it's not that I want her to be a bad artist. I don't. I feel like she has a very unique vocal timbre in the sense that like, it should work for a pop song. But she just doesn't have a good track record. She needs to fire whoever her agent is. She needs to fire her managers and get on a different label or something because wow, she has so much potential that is just being wasted with every given year. She's another artist where I'm like, what are you doing here in 2023? Not much. So why why are we giving you oxygen to breathe in in this pop charts? Is like is pop music that dead these days? Is country taking over so much that we need to give a shitty David Guetta BB Rexa song the time of day? Guess so. I think it's mainly just the sampling thing. Sampling has been, you know, an issue in the 2020s in general. I actually kind of like it. I like it when, you know, artists I like do it. <laughs> Which is wrong. I know that's a complete bias that, you know, I shouldn't say out loud. That's like the quiet part. But I mean... Come on, that's how we all feel. Sorry, my dog is um finding a new place to sleep. He's just, uh, he's over BB Rexa and so am I. I personally like very obvious sampling 
and you know it's very common in both hip-hop and pop music so in that sense like I'm fine that it's here um, and the fact that you know <laughs> Blue da -dee -da -ba -dai is the new song sampling should be more talked about as like being weird like everyone's just like oh another obvious you know m old music sample but it's like it's the fucking blue song like you know what I mean like shouldn't we think that's weird like because that's a weird song and I guess maybe by for Gen Z kids it's just been like so permanently etched into like pop culture understanding that like it doesn't seem weird or abnormal, but like that song is fucking weird. And it's really weird that it turned into like a hot girl drunk anthem, right? So yeah, weird song. Um, I would actually, you know, give it points for being like ambitiously weird if it wasn't the most generic thing to ever exist. His TikTok like really affected people's listening habits that much that this became a hit, like a top 10 hit. Because, like, I heard it a lot in the background of TikToks. Does that count towards, like, streaming numbers? It shouldn't. I don't think it does. So, like, people, you know, would use the song in their TikToks and then, like, go home and listen to it on Spotify? That doesn't sound real to me. That sounds fake. I know the, I know the reason why the radio picked it up is because both artists are, you know, established and, you know already have like record label stakeholders so like in that sense it's very easy to just throw it on the radio play and radio is more heavily weighted or at least equally weighted as streaming um compared to how relevant it is to like modern day listening culture so like i can get that that like the radio even though the song wasn't really big with people who listen to pop music any given day um because of the radio it's still like you know a hit. I understand that. And it's just so boring. Like, I'm bored. Normally I don't like to put music that is just boring on the list, but like a lot of my least favorite songs just refuse to bring a reaction out of me. I care more about the artist than I do the song itself. Um, which is a problem, which is why I'm mentioning it and it gets put on the list. But like, there's been very little songs that have like like from an aesthetic sonic level have offended me. Made a really sonically cohesive album. And uh, except for the next one, which is You Proof by Morgan Wallen. Can't believe this was like the year of Wallen. Well, I mean, I can believe it, but like, why this song, you know? I haven't even listened to that album. Cause you know, I like to spend my time wisely. You're not gonna get me to listen to a fucking 30 track country album. I'm sorry, Wallen. You're just, you're not gonna get that out of me. I feel bad for the amount of country that's in like the top half of the list because it's not that I don't like country because I do and I realize that a lot of people who chart watch don't like to talk about country they find it very boring and a few people who do get like eye rolls from like the younger generations who are like just talk about the hits I want to hear what you, your thoughts on the new Dua Lipa track not on fucking Al Dean like we don't care but 2023 became the year where that was like impossible to ignore like, all the previous years, I could have ignored country in all of my lists. I could just, you know, not put any on any lists, and most of the time, I wouldn't. I actually had a joke where I'd have, like, the arbitrary one country song that would end up on my lists, because I'd be like, I just don't care about popular country right now. The only country I really listen to is from the indie scene, I will be honest. So, it's like... I didn't want to talk about it. And I still don't want to talk about it, but, like, 2023 is literally, like the new millennia of country. It's even bigger than like the bro country boom of 2013. So it's like, I have to talk about it. And I don't like that, I dislike more of it than I do like, if that makes sense. Like, like God, God, I don't want to talk about Morgan Wallen. He is just a Pandora's box of misery and despair. And like, I feel like if I open it, I won't be able to close it back up. You know what I mean? You proof just sounds bad. So at least I can talk about it in that sense. The beat sounds like it's broken. It sounds like it got shredded by a lawnmower. Like, I don't know... I don't know what they were thinking. Well, I do know what they were thinking. I do. Which was, you know... <laughs> gotta get that pop country hip-hop appeal. I never liked when Wallen would mix fucking hip-hop and, and country influences in. Um, I feel like he always worked much more in the neat traditional sound. But I also realize that, like, people like hearing trap hi-hats in their country music, which is just not me. And that's another thing, bro country, you know, 
I don't want to get into Bro Country right now. This is what I mean. Pandora's box has been fucking opened, and I'm trying my best to close it. But overall, you proof just like... It sounds broken, you know? His voice sounds like he's gargling salt water while he's singing. And like, I don't know why he decided that would be cool or cute or quirky, uh, but it's not working. Also, I should just mention that we're, we're having back-to-back -back Wallen. I figured we'd just get it out of the way before we get into the top two songs. Um, so yeah. Number four is Last Night by Morgan Wallen. Now, this actually should be number one. It should be. Um, but because of, you know, tradition, it's not number one. Let me just clarify real quick that I recorded this way before Todd in the Shadows dropped his worst hits of 2023 video, but it's coming out after because I am very slow with how I do my editing. So I didn't know what his top songs were going to be and I didn't know they were going to be the same as mine. I guess we just think very similarly. I don't know. So yeah, sorry about that. If this is like the same as his video, because his is obviously better than mine. But anyways, yeah, I hate Morgan Wallen. Back to him. Yeah, Last Night by Morgan Wallen just sounds like a bad Maroon 5 song. And it's like, in a, bless, a blessed year where we don't have a Maroon 5 album come out, why should we put a Maroon 5 song at number one and have it be the number one song of the year? Last Night being the number one song for the year end list is just like, it makes me upset. Like, it makes me sad. Like, is this the best we got for this year? So much good country music comes out every year and we're given fucking Last Night by Mr. Wallen the number one spot. And I understand. I understand why it's number one. It's because it's the most generic, most safe sounding song of his. I agree with all the critics when they say that Morgan Wallen sounds like he's afraid to make any sudden moves. Like he seems like a, like a sad puppy who's been abused too many times. When he's the one who's been inflicting the abuse onto himself. Like all of his problems are self-made. And even the songs he makes about that don't make me sympathize with him at all. If Adam Levine sung this song, would I like it more? And the answer is yes to that question. And the fact that it is yes scares me so much that it makes this song so close to being number one. So the fact that it's at number four means that there were some bad fucking songs that came out this year, man. So number three, I'm going to try not to talk about a lot because it's it's been like the discourse song of the year and I can't do it <laughs> I, I just I can't do it man man it makes my brain hurt and like I'm not qualified to talk about the details of this thing but like I don't like it and so this is my honest opinion so that's why it's on the list number three is Richmond North of Richmond by Oliver Anthony Music now Sonically, you know, speaking of sonically cohesiveness, uh, this has none of it. This song is not sonically cohesive at all. Taylor Swift circa 2014 would be very upset. It was sonically cohesive. We were going to make a sonically cohesive record again. Make this album very sonically cohesive. Made a really sonically cohesive album. And, and I did that because I wanted this album to be more sonically cohesive. And that was for it to be sonically cohesive. I have not been making sonically cohesive albums. So, as the Fudge Round song, I'm not going to talk about that, other than the fact that um, Oliver Anthony thinks he's a lot smarter than he actually is. That's all I'm really going to say on the, you know, lyrical content. He, you know, sounds like a goddamn idiot on this song, and the fact that he's, like, basically screaming the entire time doesn't make him sound any more intellectually sound. So... That's, that's like a big problem. But other than that, well, <laughs> there actually is no other than that, which is what my main problem is. Like, other than him yelling at you while you're just trying to get your latte on, you know, the side of the street, and him plonking on his six string, it's like, there's nothing else. That's, that's all the song is. And I understand that a bunch of right-wing nut jobs decided to put it at number one because <laughs> they thought, you know, it would be a good it would be a good message to send but it really just made everyone look like goddamn idiots 
and I'm just embarrassed for them. I guess the worst year and list theme for this year is uh, is embarrassment. Like I like <laughs> like like I want to look away in shame because I feel bad for them. It's like I can't believe you're fumbling this hard, this loudly, and this publicly. You know what I mean? I know he's never gonna get another hit because uh, the people who gave him a hit he doesn't like and has publicly stated so. So, you know, they're not gonna throw any more money at him. So I just I just hope he does that, you know, he fixes his farm, takes care of his dogs, and never graces my ears ever again. Hope you live a good life, Oliver Anthony Music. Number two is Rich Flex by Drake featuring 21 Savage. Now, in a better year, <laughs> this would be number one. Uh, it's kind of like a joke I have with myself that like every year Drake drops music, which is every year because he refuses to retire. Every year there's a Drake song. At least one of them has to be at number one. Um, and I usually, I don't try to do that. Like I don't hear the new Drake song and go, oh, that's number one worst. It just, it just always is the worst sounding song that is popular in my opinion. Again, Drake sounds so comatose in this song that I wouldn't be surprised if he recorded it in his sleep. Like if 21 Snavage, you know, stuck into his room and put the microphone up to his face while he was babbling in his dreams and that's how this song got created. And I like 21 Savage. I, I like a lot of his music and I like how interesting he is with his delivery. So it's so embarrassing to hear Drake try to do the same thing with a song with him on it and fail so miserably. Like it's clear that this whole deadpan thing, only a select few can do it right, you know what I mean? And, <laughs> and Drake is not one of them, man. He just, he sounds bad. It doesn't help that the beat sounds like a bag of frozen peas that is melted on the countertop, just like this wet, gushy mush. Like, why would I ever want to spend my time listening to Drake rap over a bad beat? I feel like that sentence could be said for literally every year he's released music since like 2012. So, please stop making music, Drake, because apparently no matter what you release, people are gonna shoot it to the top 10. So if you just stop releasing music, then you can put me out of my misery. If there's one thing you can do for society, I hope it's that. Now it's time for number one. Who's the number one worst song of the year, everybody? Who's gonna guess? It's Try That in a Small Town by Jason Aldean. I just can't believe a lynching anthem was number one for one week in America. And with that, we're moving on swiftly. We're not talking about it anymore. So as for the best of the year, there are quite a lot of songs that I actually do like from this year. That's what I meant when I said that like the worst list was hard to pick. Even though this year was like a boring drip of a year for music, there were still a lot of songs that I liked, so at least that's good. I feel bad that there's not as much of a representation of country on this list, considering this was like the year of country. I feel like there should be more. Because I definitely didn't think that, you know, all the country songs that came out this year were bad. I definitely didn't think that. It's just that the ones that were popular were the ones that I wasn't a fan of. The most roundabout way of saying country music was big this year, but I just didn't like most of it. Maybe I'll make a video where I talk about country music that I like, just to balance out <laughs> the unevenness. So here's some honorable mentions. Um, I quite like Flowers by Miley Cyrus. In general, I think it's very interesting that Miley Cyrus like got another hit this year, or and, like her album was big. Um, I just think River was my favorite song on the album, and it's okay that it wasn't a hit. Like, I'm fine with that. Like, I don't need it to be popular for me to still enjoy it. It's just, Flowers probably could have made the top 10 in a different year, but this year it didn't. Also, none of the songs from the Barbie album were on this list proper, which is weird because I was almost certain that Barbie World was gonna be on the top 10 because I actually quite like that song. I wasn't expecting all of the critics to hate it, um, or at least just like not care about it. I thought maybe people would be like excited about, you know, another Nicki Minaj Ice Spice collab. People might be getting sick of Ice Spice. I'm not sure if people don't like her anymore or if she's overexposed. I think she's at just the right amount of exposure 
to where it's like, if she doesn't drop an album proper within like a few months, um, I could see her not doing good career-wise. I just think we were all surprised how much industry push she got like almost immediately. You know what I mean? But good for her. Good for her. So yeah, Barbie World should be on this list, but it's not. Same thing with What Was I Made For by Billie Eilish. Um, I don't like how this, like, very recently has been turned into, like, sad song background music. Like, at this point, it's becoming, like, Angel by Sarah McLaughlin to me, where it's, like, it's a little bit overused that I'm starting to think of it, like, as a meme song. And that makes me feel bad because, like, it is a quite touching good song. I feel like if Billie Eilish just doesn't start doing like full-on Americana acoustic stuff then like I'm just gonna be bored with this like quiet piano shit that she's doing. So there's my thought process on that. The pa most painful cut I had to make for the top 10 list was Kill Bill by SZA because this is such a good song. This should be on the list, you know? Let's just pretend it's a top 11 and Kill Bill by SZA is number 11 because I think it's a very, very good song. I'm surprised at how short it is and how that doesn't bother me. A lot of these songs that are, like, short because of TikTok have, like, like, they feel half-finished. Like, they feel like drafts. That's how I felt about that current Taylor Swift song from 1989 TV that, like, is really popular now that we don't talk. I like that song. I think it's a really good song. I just don't like that it's clearly like a draft. I thought all of these songs she was pulling out of the vault were like songs that she was finishing and not just like recording for the first time and then putting out there and not, and not bothering to make it a full song. I mean, I still like it. I like the part of it that I have, but like I wish, I wish it was completed. That's not even on the list. I, apparently I just got Taylor Swift on the brain. But Kill Bill feels like a proper song. It has all the parts it needs to. It doesn't have too much, it doesn't have too little. And that's what makes it so genius. It's the perfect 2020s sounding song. And I think S.O.S. is like one of the defining albums of this decade so far. I know we're only like literally three years into it, but still. Good stuff. I know some people were saying, and I felt this at first when I heard the song, that the chorus was very obviously like TikTok clickbait. Like, oh, people are gonna love making videos with this chorus. But I think the idea is quirky and cute enough for edgy teenagers to latch onto, but also developed enough like emotionally to work as an actual concept for a song. You know, like she does a lot of, she does a lot of good stuff with the theme of, you know, murdering your ex and his new girlfriend. Like, I feel like there's a lot of emotional maturity and um, <laughs> deciding to throw that emotional maturity away in this song that it, it really is quite special. Because I feel like that's something we don't acknowledge as often in pop music, that it's like, yeah, I have gone to therapy and I have, you know, done the work to better myself, but like, I don't want to better myself, just at least for this these two minutes that I'm gonna sing this song for. Like, I'm throwing that all out of the window because like, it doesn't emotionally satisfy me in the way that, you know, murder would, so. I'm glad she recognized that. I feel like we all feel that way sometimes. We're already entering the uh, emotional bias or personal bias part of the list because number 10 is Cruel Summer by Taylor Swift. This is a much better song so it doesn't deserve to be at number 10. Um, but I think when it comes to my own personal bias, I liked this song more when it wasn't a hit, <laughs> which is wrong. Like that is so, you know, cringy indie person of me to say, but like, it's genuinely what I feel. I feel like this song was great as a Taylor Swift deep cut. The fact that it wasn't a hit when the album came out is a bummer. I think it would have been great as, you know, one of the lead singles off of Lover. And I think I would have really loved it if it was a pop hit back then. But the fact that it never was a hit and it was just a Taylor Swift deep cut made me appreciate how good it was a lot more. Um, so then the Swifties just like catapulting it to number one because you put it on the Errors tour, like, you know, set list, um, is interesting to me. Like, Taylor Swift has already released so much shit this fiscal billboard year. She released three albums in total, plus a bunch of other extra bullshit. So it's like, couldn't we, you know, select 
songs to be hits from those albums and those albums only? Are we really pulling stuff from other ones as well? It just feels, feels unnecessary to me. I wonder if Taylor Swift is going to reach oversaturation. I wonder if that's going to happen because um, if it does, this is the year that'll do that for her. There's no way you can drop three albums in the span of 12 months, 16 months. There's no way you can do that and still have the non-stands on your side. So I guess we'll have to see when Reputation comes out, which I'm not excited for, but that's a discussion for another day. Number nine is TQG by Carol G and Shakira. Now I think both Carol G and Shakira had great years this year. And I think either kinds of songs from theirs that came out this year that isn't this one would be better on this list. But since this seems to be the only Carol G song that is on the year end list and the only like, you know, legit song that Shakira is on, not to say that the BZRP music session isn't like a legit song, but I just don't feel the need to put it on like a year end list. I feel like it's more of like a cultural thing than it is like an actual song. I'm probably wrong in that opinion, but whatever. TQG is like one of the, you know, main songs she released this year. And I really liked the Carol G album. And just, and this song isn't my favorite off of it. That, that's what I meant when I said that like, I'd prefer a different Carol G song from this year to be on the list, but this is the most popular one. So, I mean, it's still good. I'm a big fan of Carol G. She converted me this year with that album. It was, it's a pretty good album. And I don't really, I'm not fluent in Spanish. So the fact that I, I fully listened to it is like kind of a big deal. You know, just, just letting you guys know. I'm just like very interested in her as an artist now. And I'm really excited to see where, you know, her creative story leads her going forward. And Shakira has such like a emotional presence when she sings on this track that like I know what she's talking about even without translating the lyrics or like knowing what she's actually saying. Like you can just feel it in her delivery. And Carol G is also very good at that. So like the fact that they're collaborating makes me happy. So TQG, good song. And even the lyric material itself is is very fun. I, I do quite enjoy, if I'm being honest, you know, uh, like girl team up, hate your man anthems. I've always been a fan of them. And this is much better than the Shakira song with Beyonce about that same topic. I just kicked my camera, sorry. Not that I hate that Beyonce Shakira song. It's a good song. It's just this one's better. So there we go. Number eight is Boys a Liar Part Two by Pink Panthers and Ice Spice. Now, I'm actually quite a big fan of Pink Panthers, which is like surprising to me and probably surprising to a lot of people. I just, I really like her music and her album that she just dropped this year is potential <laughs> for best album of the year. Like that's surprising me a lot. I didn't think I was gonna be that big of a fan of her, but I've just liked pretty much all of the music she's dropped so far. She doesn't have a demanding vocal presence, but I think that's a good thing. I feel like her vocals work as another instrument in the arrangements that she makes on all of her tracks. And I feel like she very much speaks to this sort of modern day Gen Z kind of 2000s style that still sounds very fresh and new. Cause it doesn't feel too much like a pastiche like Bruno Mars because if Bruno Mars does it perfectly fine, but like he doesn't sound like he's making music for the modern day. He sounds like he's making a throwback versus Pink Panthers she's making very 2020 sounding music and I enjoy that while clearly recognizing its influences from previous decades. It just feels, it feels very modern and fresh and I like that because for a few years there I was afraid we weren't going to get anything modern and fresh anymore. We were just going to get 2019 new disco synth wave for the rest of time. Now I know that isn't the case, like I knew clearly things were gonna change, but like it felt a little bit dire there for a second. So like, I'm gonna support Pink the Panthers all I want. I want a million knockoffs of her. I want this to be the new sound of pop music going forward. It's clearly a more watered down version of like what a lot of people were doing with PC music and hyper pop, but like I don't fucking care because it, it goddamn bops, okay? I really appreciate her new album and the Ice Spice verse actually works because it's on topic, it, it's on theme. 
it's not that Ice Spice has never done that before. She She's actually pretty good at that when she does her guest verses or when other people have guessed on her songs. Um, but a common thing you will find with a lot of rap guest features is that they're never on topic, or very rarely are they on topic. A lot of the time, like, I'm just assuming a lot of rappers just have, like, guest feature, eight bar, you know, verses just sitting in a file somewhere, and then they just email it <laughs> to whoever asks them for a feature, because they're just generic enough about, you know, like, brand name flexing and, like, gun porn that, like, you can just, you know, put it in any song. But like this song, this verse from Ice Spice is specifically about the theme and the topic of the song. And I know that that's like the bare minimum, but it still excites me, okay? I think I want to hear Ice Spice on more of this sounding production rather than the, um, the drill sound she's been doing. Not that that's bad. I like the UK drill sound for her, um, but I want like, if she does release an album, I want half of it to be like <laughs> sounding like this kind of you know, Y2K glitch pop, or whatever we're calling it now. And I want the other half to sound like the rest of her stuff. I don't know, I feel like it would just be interesting. It'd be unique, because, like, her vocal presence on this style of music feels like it shouldn't work at all, but I, I think it totally does. So, even though this is, like, you know, probably an overplayed hit, and a lot of, like, my, you know, niche Disney Channel emo fans think that this is, like, lame, I still think it's really good. And I'd recommend checking out that Pink Panthers album if you're into that kind of pop sound. Now the next song, I'm already starting to regret having it this high, but I mean, let's just go full send. The next song is Nobody Gets Me by SZA. Um, I heard, I think it was the double agent who said that like, if Camila Cabello sang this song, y everyone would hate it. Uh, but that's the thing. Camila Cabello didn't sing this song. SZA did. And that's the literally the, probably the only reason why I like it. I was very shocked when I heard she had made an acoustic ballad, a stripped back acoustic ballad, that, you know, very much surprised me. Um, and I kind of didn't like it the first time I heard it. But as I sat down and actually kept listening to it on my own, I realized, wow, this is a very unique and special song in a different way than a lot of SZA songs are unique. I'm pretty sure the melody is in a major key, um, which is what makes it interesting because it's quite a dire track. Also, both Lana Del Rey and SZA have this wonderful ability to like croon these extremely like, you know, time specific lines and have it still not sound really weird or embarrassing. Like when Lana Del Rey bashes crypto dudes and like her very soft kind of like throwback cooing, it sounds like it should be really bad, but I think it's very charming, and it's the same thing for SZA in her very, very R&B-tinged vocal delivery, when she's delivering shit like, got me butt naked at the MGM. Like, that's, that's wonderful. That's a once-in-a-lifetime moment right there in history. You're never gonna get something like that ever again, and that's why I feel the need to appreciate it. Again, a very mature song about wanting to be immature and kind of succumbing to that feeling. I, I think it's really cool how, again, she says the quiet parts loud, you know, when she says nobody gets me but you and I only like myself when I'm with you. It's like that shit that I think a lot of people feel, but feel afraid of saying because it's like a little bit selfish and like a little bit like, you know, like scary to be that, that honest because, you know, we all don't want that to be true in our own lives. Um, but for a lot of the time it is. So again, I appreciate SZA for doing that. Interesting track. I love that it got played on the radio. I love that it was like a radio song. That, again, once in a lifetime opportunity right there. Number six. For number six, I have Escapism by Ray featuring Zero Seventy Shake. Sorry you can hear my dog like snoring in the background. I didn't think it, it was as loud as it ended up being, so I think he literally just did it again. I need to stop recording at night while my dog is exhausted. I like this song because I'm very glad we finally have a female voice in this sort of the weekend trashy R&B pop like dark tinged sound. When I first heard the song I was like ooh this is something the weekend would have made back in his early career. I love that. And again I love that it's by a, a very feminine kind of perspective. I, I really really appreciate that. The production is very unique. It's very cool. I love how it like distorts and breaks down into like this really really weird disgusting pile of goop. 
it's perfect. It works great. It's a shame that on the radio edit that they play, you know, on stations and stuff, it ends right before that happens. I know the song is kind of long, but that's fine with me. <laughs> they were they were completely fine with playing four minute long songs back in the day. Why is it all of a sudden a problem now? Play the TikTok sped up version to make it shorter. I don't care. Again, another song of giving in to your worst self and just like, you know, doing all the bad decisions. I don't know why I'm relating to that too much this year. Is that something I need to <laughs> emotionally dig into? Because I didn't think that was going to be as common as it is. But yeah, the idea of getting dumped and immediately just like going to the club and being like, okay, time to go back to my old ways <laughs> is is very charming to me. I feel like the, the assholery and the complete realization that you're being an asshole is fun. And again, it works really, really well for this kind of production, which I think is the star of the show, really. It makes me concerned if Ray is ever gonna get another hit. I have a feeling she won't. She might be a one-hit wonder kind of situation. Um, unless she, like, you know, starts kind of developing the sound of hers. Actually, I would prefer it if she just did the same trajectory that The Weeknd did. You know, make this really dark club anthem, you know, I'm the bad guy kind of fucking music, and then go into that, like, very nostalgia-tinged, tinged, like, synth area, kind of like Starboy, and, um, work with, like, a famous producer from, like, a while back. Like, what if Ray made a song with Timberland? So, yeah. I hope to hear more from Ray. I'm afraid we might not, but I want to be proven wrong, so. Great song. So, remember when I said that Post Malone was gonna be on both lists? Now's that time. Number five is Chemical by Post Malone. Does my hat look cool? Do you guys like my hat? Wait, wait, you can't even see it in the shot. Oh, it's, it's not standing up. That's the best we're gonna get it. I thought I'd wear it since this is gonna be coming out around Christmas time. Merry Christmas, everybody. So it's been, I would say it's the next day, but it's actually been a few days and uh, I'm recording the final of this video. My dog wants to come in. So now he's just gonna be awkwardly watching me while I film. Should I get a little shot of him? So here you are, and here, here he is. He ripped up the bed sheet, so. Not ripped up, he just pulled it off the corner when he hopped on, cause he's just that thick a boy. <laughs> so, there you go. So where were we? Uh, we were talking about Post Malone, right. Oh, I forgot how squeaky this chair is. So I've actually said this a few times about Post Malone, um, probably not like on this channel, but it's just like a general opinion that I have, which is that he's making the kind of music that Ed Sheeran should be making, and also it's like a representation of like the no, mo no longer popular <laughs> uh, artists who make pop music still. Like, I don't know if anyone's heard that Niall Horan album. I forget what it's called, but it was really good. Like, it was a good album, and I really enjoyed it, and, like, all the critics loved it, but it was, like, the first Niall Horan album to not do all that well, at least in America. And then same thing with Five Seconds of Summer. When I listened to Chemical by Post Malone, which is the number five song on here, by the way. Did I say that already? This Post Malone song just, like, it sounds a lot like Five Sauce Five. It makes me wonder if, like, you know, he was giving it a listen uh, while he made this album. I mean, I'm not gonna be presumptuous and say that, but... It's just the thought. When Five Sauce were being interviewed at that festival they were at in October, they were like, oh, they asked them what artists would you like to collaborate with, and, and they said Post Malone, and I want to see it too, because if this is the kind of sound that Post Malone is on right now, then I'm into it. I really do think that Chemical was a very interesting and unique, good song by Post Malone. The reason why it's like right in the middle of the list is because while I do really like this song, and in the very fleeting moments I have heard it, I really enjoy it, but I haven't actually like listened to it a lot. Like I didn't add it to any playlists or anything, which is probably one of the main reasons why it's not like higher up, but it should be higher up. So number five, I figured just right in the middle because I like it a lot, but I haven't listened to it a lot. So there we go. I can't wait to hear what Post Malone does next. I'm just very, very interested to see what he does next. He hasn't really done rap, has he? He's not really a rapper anymore. Y'all remember Stoney? Because I do. I remember everything. Number four is I Remember Everything by Zach Grind featuring Casey Musgraves. 
I'm really glad that a country song is this high up on the list. My um, sort of niche opinion on this song is that I was surprised to see how big it was on streaming because I just immediately associate streaming with like young people. I think I ranted about that earlier in this video, but I was surprised to see that this was so big on streaming and that the radio just like wasn't picking it up. And so I was like, oh, okay, Zach Bryan must be like hip with the kids. That's quite cool. That's interesting. I like that. Again, another artist doing what Ed Sheeran is supposed to be doing. Like when I was, you know, a young little blossoming emo kid, I remember everyone loved Ed Sheeran. People people loved him. They thought he was the best. And then Multiply broke his brain or something because now all he makes is shitty, watered down, disgusting pop music. Like people my age hate Ed Sheeran now. Like as soon as I say Ed Sheeran, they're like, oh yeah, this is an Ed Sheeran song. They go, ew. Like, no, I don't want to listen to Ed Sheeran. But it's like, he used to make good music. This is the kind of stuff he used to be making. Why? What happened to him? You used to be good, man. <laughs> but I'm glad that Zach Bryan is here, true. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> I was saying that I'm glad Zach Bryan is here to change that for us. What I was saying is that I think Zach Bryan being here to fill in that void is much better than keeping Ed Sheeran around. We don't need him anymore. We got plenty of artists doing what he's supposed to be doing already. Another reason why I like this song is because I can now listen to this whenever I feel the need to listen to Need You Now by Lady Antebellum. Lady A, I guess is what they're called now. Um, whenever I want like a sad, clearly about being drunk uh, couples ballad, I can listen to this song instead, it's great. But my thing about the young people is that um, I feel like young kids really like edgy acoustic guitar music, you know? Like, there's a sort of itch for like dreary, kind of drunk sounding singer-songwriter stuff. And Zach Bryan is doing that for them. Like I said, the millennials used to listen to Ed Sheeran and then he got way too clean and, and slick. And Zach Bryan is bringing that sort of rawness back. I guess also um, Stick Season, that album by that one guy. don't remember his name. I think that's doing pretty well too with the kids as well. They like that stuff. So it's nice to see that represented on the, uh, on the charts these days. Because I feel like there are always kids listening to like slightly emo singer-songwriter stuff. And um, this is proof of that, you know? As soon as we get one from an artist that has like real groundswell, you know, Groundswell? He has real upward momentum in his career. Put that kind of sound onto the top 10 and to number one, at least for a week, is really cool. Also, I'm a big fan of Casey Musgraves. I've always loved her stuff. I've always thought she's a really good country artist and it's very depressing uh, once I learned the kind of what happened to her career. Uh, so. It's good to see her finally get redeemed and, and get that, that number one spot. I know it doesn't really matter, but like to the industry people it matters. So it's cool to see her finally get that. So good song. It should also be higher on the list, but uh, the top stuff is the stuff I've listened to the most. So that's kind of why it's like up there. I don't really listen to this song that often, even though I know it's really good. It's just, it's one of them things. So. There you go. There's literally no reason to listen to Oliver Anthony music when you have Zach Bryan. I have a stupid piece of hair in my face. Oh. Okay, number three. We're almost done, guys. Number three. Number three is Vampire by Olivia Rodrigo. I've actually been seeing a lot of people shitting on this song. Seems like people don't like it. And I think her chart success maybe is an example of that. I don't know. When Rodrigo released her album Guts, I felt like there wasn't as much fanfare about it as there was for Sour. Which, you know, I'm not saying she's sophomore slumped or anything. I truly just think it was on accident that a bunch of other shit was happening this year in pop music. So we weren't able to pay attention to her as much. And everyone just kept saying that Vampire sounded way too much like Driver's License. And that they liked Driver's License more. And like, I kind of get that. I think she was trying to use a very similar, if not the exact same, sonic palette from Driver's License. To kind of provide some cohesion throughout her music. She's being very sonically cohesive, if you will. I have not been making sonically cohesive albums. I'm sorry. I'm, I don't want to, I didn't mean to be mean to Taylor Swift as much in this video, but it happens, okay? And I've sort of accidentally listened to Vampire like 20 million times this year, which is why it's so high on the list. It's like definitely the pop song 
one of the pop songs at least, I've listened to the most this year. People were making fun of the fame fucker line, which, I mean, don't you guys get it? I don't understand why everyone was so confused by it. I just like that she really goes for it vocally. She brings a lot of drama to the song, which is what a lot of people were also saying is that they hate about it, is that it feels too theater kid, which it does. I will say it does feel very theater kid. And those sort of like pulsating bass loud sounds that happen near the middle to the end uh, is definitely not as good of a build as uh, it was in Driver's License, I will say. They're a bit awkward sounding. It would have been better if it was just like only live percussion and not like some sort of weird trackpad sound that they were doing, but I still think it was quite good. I mean, I don't think it's as good as Bad Idea, right? I'll say that right now, but like I didn't listen to that song as much as I listened to this one, so that's why this one's higher. Also, let me just clarify that Bad Idea Right actually didn't make the year-end list for 2023, which probably means it's going to get stuck in between years, which is very disappointing because it's definitely a really good song, and in retrospect, I'd rather put that song at this place than Vampire. So, sorry Olivia, hope you do better next time when it comes to the trends and you don't get ignored. Like you did this year. I mean, it was still a very successful album run. I'm not gonna tell you it was a flop or anything. It's just that, like I said, people were much more busy and occupied with other things happening. So. Overall, I think Guts is a better album than Sour. It's more, like, strong when it comes to, you know, the track listing. But... I don't know if it's going to have as much of a cultural impact as Sour did. I'm wondering if maybe her third album, uh, if it comes out at like a better point in time for her. Like no one was going to predict that this was going to happen with pop music, so I don't, I don't blame them. They took a decent amount of time off, you know, to where it didn't feel like she was oversaturating and trying to shove music down people's throat, you know, like she took a year off and then came back with the new album a year later. Like that makes sense, you know, but. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes you just get the short end of the stick. People were way too interested in what was happening with country than they were with pop music. The only pop artist we had enough room for was Taylor Swift, and she was just doing absolutely way too much this year. So yeah, R.I.P. to Miss Olivia. Um, I'm excited to see what she does next. I quite like Guts. I want to buy the album, all that stuff, you know? As for number two, this is kind of a weird one for me. Um, I'm surprised it's as high as it is, but like when I was looking through the songs, I was like, this is definitely the song that I like the most out of all of these. I've already talked about SZA on this list so far. I have these like sort of arbitrary rules where what I usually do is only allow two songs from each artist onto the top 10 itself because, you know, for certain artists, I can just put like their entire discography if all of it was on the year end list. Um, and for SZA, that's an example of this. I loved S.O.S. so much that I'm like, you know, really struggling to not put more songs of hers on there. I think I already said that, but yeah. I feel like with any good pop album, there's always like one song that each person like latches themselves to and it's like, this is my current SZA song of the month, you know? I felt that way with Future Nostalgia. I feel like there were so many songs on there that like you could just listen to and just love for a good chunk of time and have that be like your one. And like each person, that's a different song on the album. And for me, that's Shirt by SZA. I just, I don't know why I've attached myself to this song so much. And I was surprised to even see it end up on the year in Hot 100 because there were just so many SZA songs that people loved and enjoyed and kind of circulated. And this one, a little bit felt like yesterday's news just because it came out technically in 2022 as a single and I mainly listened to it like at the beginning of this year so I took a few months off from this song but then when I went back and listened to the Hot 100 I was like oh this this made it it made it onto the list and didn't get pushed out by all like the other SZA songs that were big this year and I just I love it so much I don't know what it is I don't know why this is the SZA song I like more than the others I bet Kill Bill is better deserving of being number two than this one, but this is just the one that I've emotionally attached myself to the most. Did I already talk about how SZA is able to do that thing that Lana Del Rey can do, where they say very obviously trendy stuff in their songs, but like it still doesn't put me off? Because Shirt is a great example of that. It's very satisfying, is, is all I'm trying to say here. Like, I don't even really know what the song is about. I think it's just 
It's just, she's just talking about all the things that are pissing her off recently. It's just a vent of all of the angry things that are happening, you know? Like, she has a, a guy and he's treating her like shit. All of these girls are like fucking trying to beef with her. And she's just like, I'm sick of it. And then just like a little bit of a sprinkle of like self-doubt and like self-hatred mixed in there, which is another thing that's starting to piss you off. You're like, damn, why do I hate myself so much? And also, why does everyone hate me so much? Like, what's, what's going on here? That's what I've like interpreted from the lyrics and I love it. Her saying feeling lost but I like it is also like just a really weird mood to be in. And I feel like that was, that was where I was at this point this year, you know, feeling lost but like I'm, I don't want to not be lost. I don't want to change yet. <laughs> so yeah, overall I just, man, this song is so good. I like the production. I feel like this was like a weird single. I feel like this probably would have worked best just as like a deep cut. And I probably still would have loved it either way. So overall, big fan of SZA this year. I really hope, I wonder if she's gonna release more music. She could just be one of those like people who just, just stops making music. And honestly, I, even though I'd be upset to not get more from her, this album, this album is enough for me for a long time. So hope to take a good rest, SZA. Do I like it more than Control, though? I don't know. I don't know if I like it more than Control. That, that's a hard question. They're just the two great different albums, you know? It's kind of like with Kendrick, where it's like, obviously, Tip of a Butterfly is his best album, right? Like, everyone says that. But, like, I listen to Damn more often. So I think I like Damn more than I like Tip of a Butterfly. But that's like, that feels wrong to say because like Tip of a Butterfly is like obviously better. I don't know. It's a, com it's a complicated feeling I have. And that's how I feel about SZA's two biggest albums. So there you go. We're at number one, guys. What's going to be number one? What's going to be number one for me? Does anyone have any guesses? You want to leave them in the comments below? I kind of hate it when YouTubers say that. Like, oh. Guess what my next, the next thing I'm about to say in the comments below, it's like I can just hit the little forward button, the little key, and just find out. I'm not gonna fucking leave a comment, because then everyone who reads the comments might have already seen it, and they're like, what the fuck does this mean? We already know what their number one is. Why did you <laughs> leave your suggestion in the comments below? So I don't know why I said that. Just think it in your head, and leave a comment about whatever you want. I sound like a rambling fool, like a raving nutter. That doesn't sound cool in my American accent. I'm sorry, Bindi Irwin. I never thought of playing Sundrop as a raving nutter. So number one is Calm Down by Rima featuring Selena Gomez. Are we surprised? Is that like shocking for everyone to hear? I'm such a Selena Gomez stan that like, I feel like that was, <laughs> that was predictable on my part. So here's the thing about this song. I don't know much about Afrobeat, and I heard this is a good introduction into that genre of music, and that it's not like all the genre has to offer. Um, but I do find it quite nice that Afrobeat is like having its moment in time now with pop music. I really hope with 2024 it like actually blossoms. I don't want it to be like Jersey Club, where it's like only two artists basically get get a hit, and then like it just kind of goes away. Unless Jersey Beat is about to have like a huge 2024, who knows. But considering pop music is like, was so weird in 2023 and country really dominated, I really hope that like Afrobeat, you know, comes into its own and becomes really popular in America. Cause if it all sounds like this, then like, you know, I would not be <laughs> upset to hear that on the radio all the time. Cause it's, it's really good so far. That and the song Water, which, you know, I should have mentioned, I feel like it's gonna be more of a hit in 2024 than it is now. I like the song Water by Tyla. The only thing is I just don't like the phrase, make me water. Right now, let's talk about Selena Gomez, guys. I know she's only featured on this song and it's not really her song, but like, I have so many opinions on Selena Gomez, so I'm just gonna rant about her for a second. Everyone's always called her just like the most boring artist to ever exist and that like all of her songs are bad and boring but like I feel like that's not a fair assessment. I mean yes I do agree her stuff when she was in the scene was a lot better. Not to say that you know the stuff she does now is bad. She's clearly a very talented artist. I just feel like people always put her in weird stuff or like she doesn't make music that's best for her, her talent. 
if that makes sense. I think her EP that she released either last year or the year before was really good. She sounds amazing when she sings in Spanish, and that kind of production worked perfectly for her vocals. I feel like she's one of those artists where the production needs to fit with her. Um, I agree that like she just can't she just can't do any kind of style of music like some other artists can like Gaga she can do any style of music she can do a you know a jazz cut if she wants and then she can do her whole pop thing but like Selena Gomez has to be in a very specific kind of sound for her to work for most people <laughs> that's why I don't hate Back to You as much as so many other people hate like I remember seeing people be like this is one of the worst songs ever Back to You is bad we hate Selena Gomez right now and I'm like what was was so wrong with that song. Hmm? I kind of liked it when she got a little bit weird with um, Fetish and uh, Bad Liar. Yeah, that song was slamming. Like, that was great. I feel like she should do some more weird stuff like that, you know? And then she's done some really good stuff on some featuring songs like this one. She sounds amazing on this kind of light, airy, summery kind of beat. There's a reason why this song was so big in the summer. I would call this the song of the summer. Even though we don't really have those anymore in modern day pop music world, I would still call this Song of the Summer because it was just, it was just delicious. She sounds amazing on this track. I feel like her kind of light, breathy vocals are amazing and she should do it more often. I didn't really like Single Soon because of that. She just feels like she's trying to do a Taylor Swift thing and she can't do Taylor Swift. But also Taylor Swift can't do Selena Gomez, so you know. There's some proof there. They're very different artists when it comes to the kind of music that sounds the best when they make it, you know? Taylor Swift couldn't even do Reputation, and she did Reputation. But like, I would argue that I don't think anyone could do Reputation because it just sounds that dog shit. I was talking about Remo though. I think Remo's a great artist. I actually liked seeing him featured on that Pink Panthers album. He sounded interesting on there. He sounded a lot like Travis Scott, which if he's gonna do that, in other songs, like, I mean, I guess that's fine. Like, I'm not mad. Like, I'd rather him replace Travis Scott, because, like, I don't think we need him anymore <laughs> in our lives, you know? Uh, let's just get Rima in there instead. This is the year where, like, all of the, like, late 2010s artists are, like, starting to get cycled out. Like, we're refreshing them for a new class of artists, and I like that. I, I like that we're, you know, we're moving on. We're moving forward. <laughs> And hopefully we can leave some other artists in the past, you know? Like, Travis Scott doesn't need to exist post-2020 or... You know what I mean? Like, let's just move forward with music. And if Rima is going to be like a new star, I'm excited to see it. Because I really like this song. And this was his song originally, so... He did a very good job. I really hope he's not a one-hit wonder is what I'm trying to say. So yeah, that's my... There's my top ten. I finally did it. I actually did it, guys. I was not expecting to get this done, if I'm being honest. I had been putting this off for so many years, actually doing this video. And like I said, I'm not expecting anyone to find it, like, cool or amazing. I'm just... This is more for me. Hopefully, a podcast episode will be coming out in a few days. It depends on when I drop this. Hopefully I can get this out before Christmas and then the podcast episode will be out on Christmas Day. If I don't get this out before Christmas, then boy do I look stupid wearing this hat and uh, the podcast episode will already be out. So December I was hoping to get more stuff out because this is like the big AdSense year, but like my channel isn't monetized yet, so I guess that doesn't really matter. But I just figured YouTube might put more eyes on my stuff during this month, but I've just been busy in general. I thought now that I'm on break away from school and I'm back in my childhood home that uh, I would have some time, but no, I have no time. I'm just busy as fuck as always. So I'm so glad I got to make this. Thank you for watching. Check out um, the Spotify playlists with all the songs I mentioned in it. I think I'll put it in the description at the end of the video. I don't know if anyone actually checks out those Spotify codes I put at the end of my videos. I just kind of do it for fun. Just cuz. So yeah, that's about it. Uh, let me know what your favorite hit songs of the year were. They don't have to be on the Billboard Hot 100. If I wasn't so goddamn lazy, I'd also include any song that was in the top 40. But that just adds a lot of more songs than just 100 to the list, and that's hard for me to do. So if someone were to make like a playlist of every top 40 song of each year, it would be more easy for me, but yeah. That's all. Let me know what your favorite hit songs of the year were, or just your favorite songs that came out in 2023. I'd like to know that. The Taylor Swift re-recorded songs don't count. 
okay? That's my personal opinion. If, if the song came out when it did. 1989 came out in 2014, those songs are in 2014. Just because she did a cover of it in 2023 does not mean it counts as a 2023 song. Only the vault tracks count. That's that's my controversial opinion. Although I don't care if you if you put if you put style as your favorite song of 2023. Although that re-recorded version is so shit that I don't think anyone would put that as their top song in 2023. I didn't mean to be so mean to Taylor Swift in this video. I like her. Yeah, okay, that's it. I better stop before I do more Taylor Swift slander in this video. Okay. Bye everybody. Thank you for watching. I feel like I look super pale in this video. Just haven't been getting any sun at all is what it is. I Remember Everything by Zach Bryan featuring Casey Musgraves is number three on this list. It's only number three, but like it deserves to be there. No, it's four. Fuck!